Bibles, I want you to look with me in Isaiah, the sixth chapter. We've got a beautiful day to share together. And I've got uh, three messages that I want to share with you. The good news is they're not all going to happen today. Okay? Look at your neighbor and say, thank God I did not bring a snack for that. Okay? But over the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about what happens when God shows up. Now, the Bible teaches us that the creator of this universe is everywhere all the time. If you study theology, the term for that is omnipresence. And it's a simple truth. God is everywhere. You can't go anywhere where God isn't. Okay? Now, I know you feel like you've been to some places where you felt like it was a God-forsaken place, but the reality of it is God is everywhere. Okay? In Psalm 139, verses 7 through 12, this will come up on the screen, or it should. You don't have to turn there. The psalmist declared this, Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend into heaven, you're there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, you're there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. and Your right hand will hold me. If I say, surely the darkness will fall on me, even the night shall be light about me. Indeed, the darkness shall not hide from you, but the night shines as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to you. This is David declaring the truth from Scripture, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, just explaining we can't go anywhere where God isn't. And that ought to be a comfort to us. Aurora's song gave testimony of that in such a wonderful way. But while we know and can say with great confidence that God is everywhere, we've also got to admit there are times when His presence is a little more perceivable than at other times. You know what I mean? You read through the Bible and you find out about times like this. There was this guy named Moses who was really running from God. He was running for his life too, but he was running from God and he found himself working for his father-in-law, Pause and think about that for a moment. Working for his father-in-law, taking care of sheep out in the desert. And God showed up in a perceivable, tangible way in the form of a burning bush. Even though God is everywhere all the time, there are times when we can sense His presence more distinctly. For that same guy Moses, after he was used of the Lord to build this, this place of worship... God showed up with him there, but only let him see, let Moses see his backside at that time, okay? If you read through the Bible, you come up and you talk about, we find out about this guy named Elijah. He's serving the Lord, and he's at a very low time in his life, and he's hiding from his circumstances, and he's hiding from a woman who's trying to kill him, and he's in this cave, and God sends this fire and this wind and all these other theatrical things, but God's not in any of that in that moment. There's this still small voice that speaks to His Spirit. God showed up for Elijah in a tangible way. You read a little bit further in the, uh, in the Bible and you find out about these guys who are following the Lord. They're referred to as Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They're staying true to the Lord in a pagan culture. And because they will not bow and worship an idol, they get thrown in this fiery furnace. And they accept that punishment instead of reneging on their faith in God. And God showed up in the middle of that fiery furnace in a tangible way. You read a little bit further and there is these, this pagan leader, Belshazzar. He's taking the things of God and treating them as common. And that was just a symptom of so many other things this man had done wrong. And while 
he and his cronies are having this drunken party, they get shaken out of their stupor when the hand of God writes a message on the wall and says, you're not living up to what you're supposed to be living up to. God showed up in a tangible way. You come into the New Testament. God put on flesh and dwelt among us in the form of Jesus. And this miraculous work of the incarnation and God living in this world. And Jesus, the Son of God, who is also God, gets to the point in time where He knows He's about to enter into His earthly ministry and He knows that it's time for Him to go and be baptized. And He set the example for us that these three young girls have followed today. Though when Jesus was baptized, God showed up and said, That's my boy, you need to listen to him. I'm happy with him. And sometime later, in Jesus' earthly ministry, he and a few of his disciples go apart up onto a mountain, and Jesus is praying, and he's getting ready to fulfill his mission. And there's this amazing transformation that takes place in his body. And two other guys show up there. Their names are Moses and Elijah. And Peter speaks up and says, Lord, it's good that we're here. Let's put down some tents and let's camp here for a while. And God showed up and said, Peter, listen to what my son has to say. God showed up in a tangible way. God's everywhere. But there are times, my friends, when His presence is very perceivable and very real. Isaiah had a time like that in his life. It's recorded in Isaiah the 6th chapter. Look there with me. I want you to see what's going on here. In Isaiah the 6th chapter, we're going to look just at the first four verses. The prophet of God records these words, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And above it stood seraphim, and each one had six wings, and with two they covered their face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And they cried out to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of His glory. And the posts of the door were shaken by the voice of Him who cried out, and the house was filled with smoke. Isaiah records a time in his life where things were very, very difficult and he went to pray and God showed up in a tangible way. According to Isaiah, this special presence of God was sensed and seen by him in the year that King Uzziah died. He experiences this when when a, a beloved king has has his life end. Now, if you read in the Old Testament, you'll find out Uzziah was an interesting character. He became king of Judah at the time that you and I could get a driver's license. Dude was 16 years old and they made him king. And he reigned, according to the Scripture, for 52 years in the land. He went from getting his driver's license as king all the way to retirement. As king, well, actually, he stepped into eternity. That's how kings retired back in that time, I guess. Fifty-two years, and if you read in Second Chronicles the twenty-sixth chapter, you would find the full story or a good synopsis of Uzziah's reign. But Second Chronicles twenty-six four tells us this about Uzziah's leadership: He did what was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father Amaziah had done. That could not be said of all the Old Testament kings. But it could be said of Uzziah. That means that Uzziah was a favored king. He was a popular king. He was a king that God used for much of his life to do great things for the people. And by the way, even though we're not in a kingdom now, we're in a a, a republic or democracy, we like it when we have leaders who bless us. Amen? Well, Uzziah was a leader... who who did what God said for the most part, and under his leadership, uh, Judah had this great army that got formed. And because they had a good army, 
They could conquer any land that they needed to, and they also had a deterrent from anybody else coming and trying to take over with them. You know what I mean? Having a strong military helps with that. Amen? Thank God for the military that we have in this great land. Well, Uzziah not only had things going on uh, to secure the homeland, but he also led them in great economic times. He made improvements to the infrastructure and agriculture. He, he saw to it that things got better. The, the two, these two major successes made it to where his status among the people increased. They could lay their heads down at night and not be afraid of an enemy evasion. And they got up the next day and they had money in the bank. Man, when you got that going for you, you'll get anybody's vote, right? We would vote for that person. Some of us will, right? Uzziah had that going on. But he ran into a problem. Everything was going good for Uzziah. But somewhere along the way, he reached a point in his leadership where he thought he could do anything he wanted. So what happens to a lot of people when things are going well. God's blessing them, and they get to a point where they feel like the rules no longer apply to them. But you listen to me today. This is not going to be the topic of today's sermon, but it's coming up next week, and I'm giving you a forewarning. I'm not telling you that so you can stay away. I'm telling you that so you can come and hear. All of us have boundaries set on us and limitations set on us by God. We've all got some God-ordained rules that we've got to live by. Even the king in the Old Testament times. The king had all kinds of power. But the king was not given the privilege or the responsibility of going into the place of worship and offering incense on the altar. That was God's rule in the Old Testament strictly for the Levites, for the priests. But Uzziah, in all of his success, reached a point where he thought, you know what? I'm the king. I'm all that and a bag of chips and an RC cola and a moon pie. If I want to go into the place of worship and offer some incense, what's the big deal? There's nobody greater in this land than I. So Uzziah went in and did what he knew God didn't want him to do. He thought he was smarter than God. And my friends, that's a bad place to get to. As he is offering these incense before the Lord, the priests had the courage to confront him. They did so respectfully but they did so clearly. They said, Uzziah, you're the king, but what you're doing right here isn't for you to do. It's only for us, and you know that. And Uzziah responded to that confrontation like most people do. He got ticked. Who do you think you are telling me not, I can't do this? I'm the king. I'll do what I want to do. And he no sooner responded with that attitude and God Himself struck him with leprosy. God showed the one who's really in charge. And let me tell you, my friends, if God's given you a position of responsibility, praise Jesus. Is he, if He's given you influence and, and, and power over others, praise God for that. But you better remember, none of us have more authority or power than God. Well, most of us know that. Even in our jobs, we're not that big of a deal. I mean, we're not mayors or governors or or even presidents, right? Well, guess what? Whoever we are, wherever we are, we have some influence. But we all are going to give an account to God Almighty one day. Uzziah found that out that day and he was struck with leprosy. And though he didn't die immediately, he got quarantined and separated from his family and friends and lived out the rest of his days at a greatly diminished rate and state of leadership. God showed who was really in charge. And the day finally came where Uzziah stepped into eternity. Some of you remember a time in this nation where a beloved leader 
John F. Kennedy was suddenly assassinated. That happened in 1963. I can say that was slightly before my time, but only slightly. For many of you hearing this today, you're thinking, wow, that was forever ago. But just raise your hand real quick if you remember the day that happened and where you were. All right? When tragedy strikes, it gets etched in our hearts and minds. Some of us remember when the space shuttle exploded. Raise your hand if you remember that. A few more of us. Some of us, more of us remember 9-11 when planes went into towers. Raise your hand if you remember that. Okay? When tragedy strikes, it's etched in our hearts and minds. And when tragedy strikes, we have a tendency to look to God. Uzziah was a beloved king. In spite of his indiscretion, in spite of, of the struggle that he had in, in getting too proud, he was still loved by the people. And when he died, the people were hurt. They were grieving. And Isaiah, among others, decided to go look for God. God's everywhere all the time. But sometimes His presence is more perceivable than others. I want you to understand, God often shows up when we really look for Him. Jeremiah declared this, Jeremiah 29, 13, And you will seek Me and find Me when you search for Me with all your heart. I'm convinced, my friends, while God is everywhere, I believe He wants to be more perceivable to us a lot of times than what we allow Him to be because we're not really looking for Him at work. And He's there anyway. When we get to really get serious about looking for God, we sense His presence more. We tend to look for Him when we're hurting. When we're hurting, we need comfort. Amen? When sickness hits us, we cry out to God. When we lose loved ones, we cry out to God. When the economy's not going our way, we cry out to God. When things are bad, we cry out to God. We want comfort. And if we're perfectly honest, we want to complain. Thank you, Robert. One of us confessed. Don't tell me the rest of us don't like to complain. <laughs> I've been pastoring you for four and a half years. I know some of you want to complain. And I'm right in there with you. Listen, there's some things I complain about too, and there are times when I complain to God. And let me tell you, it's actually okay to do that in a respectful way. When we need comfort from God, we cry out to Him as well. Lord, do you not know? I know how, how preposterous it sounds. Lord, do you not know what's going on in Washington? <laughs> Or do you not want know what's going on in Charleston? Do you not know what's going on in, in my loved one's life? Do you not know what's going on in my life? Lord, why aren't you answering? Listen to me. When we're hurting, there's a tendency for us to seek God more. And there are times when He comes and He shows up in a perceivable way. And when God shows up, what are we really supposed to do? I'm telling you, my friends, from the text that we started today and we're going to finish over the next two weeks, there are three things that happen when God really shows up or when we understand that He's really there, however you want to look at that. The first one is this. When God shows up, we worship. That's the first thing that's got to happen. Did you see what went down when God showed up in that temple? Isaiah went to pray. And while he's there, he looks up and he sees the Lord seated on the throne. And along with the Lord seated on the throne are these angels who are going around and they're flying and they're singing praises to God and they're crying out, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, the Lord of hosts. They're worshiping the one who's worthy of our worship. 
And my friends, I want to tell you, when we really understand that God is there, the first thing we have to do is worship Him because He's the one that's worthy of it. I don't know if you understand what worship really is, but it's complicated but also simple. Worship takes place when we ascribe the highest value to something or someone. That's what worship really is. Now, I took some time to think about it. I've got some things in my life that I place some value on. You do too, but let me share a few that I have. One of the things I value is my truck. Oh, you, you laugh if you want to. That's a good looking truck. And I'm not the only one that values it. The dealership that sold it to me valued it. Amen or oh me. I can't complain about that. I bought mine before the, the price hikes really kicked in. I'm grateful for that, okay? But I will tell you this. <laughs> Years ago, I had a car, and I'm grateful for a car that got me from A to B. But I wanted a truck so bad. Oh, I wanted a truck so bad. And finally I got one. And that time that I wanted one, I, I saw these kids out there with trucks that were like this high off the ground. You guys remember when those were popular? Okay, they're not still popular, are they? I hope I'm not stepping on anybody's toes here. Look, if that's your thing and you want to get a truck and you want to have it like three and a half inches off the ground, that's you. But I tell you, when I saw that and I wanted a truck so bad, I promised God if He blessed me with a truck, I'd never do that to it. <laughs> I just promised Him. I said, Lord, if You bless me with a truck, I will, I will use that thing. You know, I'll, I'll enjoy riding around in it. I will haul things off to the dump. I'll help people. Because look, when you get a truck, you got a target on your back, man. Hey, raise your hand if you're a truck owner. You know what I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah. All right? Well, let me tell you something. I put some high value on my truck. I keep that thing clean. I keep it maintained. I just enjoy having that truck. I, I put value on my home. Let me tell you something. Ruth and I were asked recently, where do we go to relax? We go home. <laughs> we just go home. We take that short, straight, flat drive out to Beeson Road and we pull up in that driveway and we just get out there and, and you know, it, it is a comfortable, safe place to just rest. And let me tell you, the people I bought it off of, they put a value on that home. And I put value in this place that Ruth and I and four cats get to call home now. Okay? We love having people out. We love being there and just relaxing down in the lower part of that property. I don't have pictures of that. I can show you later if you'd like to see it. I've got a place set up where we can go and we can shoot guns. And my son-in-law and daughter, when they come up, my son-in-law brings these weapons up that he's amassed. And he's got one weapon and he brought us some Tannerite. And he brought a microwave up that was broken. And we set some, some Tannerite inside that microwave. And he shot that thing and blew that thing to smithereens. Yeah, I put value on my home. <laughs> it's a nice place to relax and do what you want to do and scare the neighbors half to death sometimes. I value my home. I value my health. I go to the gym and I run. I try to exercise six days a week. Now, I don't look like Taylor. But I keep telling Taylor, if he'll work out like me, he'll look like me. So we're getting there. But I spend some time because I value my health. I want to feel good. And I want to be able to go and do. I value my health and I spend time and money investing in that. I value the ministry that God's called me to. You see this picture up here? I don't know how well you can see that, but I had to divide that in two. That's for Easter Sunday, guys. Y'all look so good. I tried to get the whole panoramic up there, but for some reason my iPhone wouldn't let me email it and it come up that way. But man, I, I am grateful for the service God's called me to. 
I, I didn't ask for this, okay? Uh, it's not a generational thing with me, and I'm not knocking people who have families where it's just kind of like a generational calling. God calls sometimes multiple people in a family into ministry, into vocational ministry. If that's God's calling and the way it works for you, so be it. But, you know, I, I'm not a PK. Well, technically I am. My dad was a postman, okay? But he wasn't a preacher. I, I didn't ask for this calling, but I received it. And I'm thrilled that I get to put my full-time effort to preaching the gospel and discipling people and helping now this congregation be the congregation that God wants it to be. I put high value on that. I value my family. Oh my goodness. My family's grown. I've got two kids. They've given me three grandkids. And just about a year ago, I got a wife. Oh man, she is the better half of this equation we call us. I'm grateful for that. And when Ruth and I got married, I went from three grandkids to seven. Okay? Praise God for that. Got the four cats to boot. Love them too. Hey, I love my family and I hope you love your family and you value your family as well. There are a lot of things and a lot of people that we can and should value in this world. But let me tell you something, my friends. Of all the things and people that I put value on, the most important person I put value on is Jesus Christ and my relationship with Him. You see, He's got to be first. He's got to be number one. He's better than any truck by far. He's better than going and working out, definitely. He's greater than the ministry that He gave me. And if you can comprehend it, as grateful as I am for my family and for so many other things, He's above all those things and people because He did the one thing for me that no thing or other person could do. He's the one that came and died on the cross so, so that I could be saved. He's the one that's washed me from my sins. And He's the one that's trusting me now to go and tell a lost and dying world all about Him. He's got to be first. And the second, the, the very second that I put anything or anyone above Him, that's what I'm worshiping. And I'm telling you today, my friends, He's got to be first. He's the only one worthy of worship. He's the only one worthy of us ascribing that highest value and honor to. But how does that actually happen? I mean, what's that look like? Well, there, there's all kinds of ways and all kinds of places that this thing called worship can take place. And just understand... Worship, first of all, it can take place anywhere. It can occur in all kinds of places. Uzziah showed up. Uh, he went to the, the place of prayer. He went to the tabernacle. He went to pray. And he encountered God there. And I want you to know, when we gather up in church, I hope this is a place you encounter God. I know it's a place I encounter Him. We want Him to show up and show out when we gather in worship. Amen? But I, I, I am aware keenly aware that you can experience God's presence and you can worship Him in other places. Listen to me. I have found secluded places in various hospitals across this land to go and bow before God and worship Him. It can take place in a hospital. I've gone to people's homes and visited with them and talked with them about great concerns and we've knelt in prayer and agreed in prayer and I've seen God show up and we've worshipped Him in people's homes. I know that you can go out in this great land that we call almost heaven, West Virginia, and in other places throughout this land and world and you can see the beauty of God's creation and He can show up there and you can worship Him there. That truck that I told you that I value so much, I worship Him there driving down the road and sometimes I'm praying for those idiots that are out there. Now, you know what I'm talking about. Raise your hand if you've encountered an idiot out on the road. Alright? Put your hand down. Raise your hand if you're sitting beside... No, don't do that. Don't, no, no, no. No. Let's not go there. Listen. Worship 
can happen anywhere God shows up and because God is everywhere, He can make Himself known and perceivable in a multitude of places. And when God shows up, we need to worship. Worship can take, play, can take place in various places and worship is demonstrated in numerous ways. We've practiced some of those already this morning. We've practiced worshiping God by singing praises to His name. Amen. Thank God for a praise team and for the soul sisters and for this ladies worship team and for these special singers who come and stand before us and help us stand together and worship the Lord through song. That's biblical and that's right. We can worship the Lord through singing. We can worship the Lord through praying. My friends, you ought to talk with God on a regular basis. I hope you do it way more than just when you show up at church. I hope you do it way more than just when you're about to eat your food. I hope you rise every morning and talk to Him and I hope throughout the day you have a conversation with Him and I hope before you lay your head on that pillow at night that you talk with Him. Praying is a form of worship. We can worship God by talking with Him. There are times in worship where we literally need to just, those who can, we sense His presence so clearly that we, we, we know He's there and we have to simply bow down before Him. Listen, my friends, this position, this literal position, is an act of submission. It is an act of honor. It's an act of giving glory to God. And sometimes we worship God by bowing down. There are other times when, when we're to... We're getting blessed in church or some other time. We're listening to the radio and hearing this great song. And man, we just raise a hand and testify for the Lord. And boy, this gets a little funny sometimes in church. We've had a lot of debate about this that I've heard down through the years. Some people said, man, when you're getting blessed by a song, you've got to raise your right hand. Okay? And somebody else said, no, no. When you're, you're blessed by the Lord, you've got to raise your left hand because you see, that's the one that's got you... You ring, your wedding ring on it, and you watch on it, and your billfold might be back here, and you're raising your left hand, you're giving him your marriage and your time and your money. And somebody else said, Look, just raise them both. That way he's got it all. Amen. And I know it might not be a thing for you. You might not feel comfortable doing that, but hear me today, even if you just got to do this right here, raise your hand and praise the Lord. It's all right. We can praise the Lord. By sitting down, you're seated and I'm standing today and I know you can praise the Lord in song and in worship and you can, you're can shouting amen to the things you like and maybe to some of them that you don't. You can honor God and worship Him in a seated position. You can honor Him by standing up. You can stand to your feet and give glory to the Lord. You, you can honor the Lord by speaking up. You can, you can let your voice declare, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. When somebody's doing wrong, you might have to speak up on behalf of the Lord. When somebody's done well, you might have to speak that word of encouragement. Speaking up is a form of worship. But listen, we could go on until noon today talking about the acts of worship that we can do. But what I want you to understand, the most important act of worship is this. It's living in obedience to God's Word. You see, I would hope when we gather up that you reach a time where you've enjoyed some songs, where you've enjoyed that we've baptized people, well, you're glad that you got to see brothers and sisters in the Lord. Hopefully you got something out of the message that's been presented. Hopefully you go out of here and you've experienced something great. Maybe it's something you can clap about. Maybe it's something you can shout about. Maybe it's something you can raise your hands about. Maybe it's something you can really get happy about. But I want you to know, it's all kind of for naught if you don't go out of this place and carry it with you and live it out, out there. We worship the Lord, not only through these acts of organized worship, but most importantly, through going out here and living faithfully for Him day in and day out. Well, guys, I don't know how you are at worshiping. And I know we come here a lot, Sundays and Wednesdays and some other times occasionally. But I hope as we close out today, you'll take some time to simply truly worship in spirit and in truth. I know we've done it already, but I hope you'll do it some more. You see, um, 
we get used to some patterns, right? We got a couple songs. We, you know, somebody comes up to begin with and welcomes. We do some announcements. We celebrate some birthdays and some anniversaries. And today we mess up the apple cart. Praise Jesus! We baptize three people. Yeah, that's how the ordinary. And I hope that becomes ordinary. But then we, we're led in some amazing songs and we sing those together and it's time to pray and we pray and we dismiss the kids and somebody sings a special and then you got to listen to that guy for however long and we know he's going to go, well, he's going to go until he's done. That's what he's going to do. I can tell you that I'm him. But what about, what about if God just showed up? You see, we get so used to our patterns and we just cannot even see when He's at work. I've been told, I haven't experienced this, but I hope to. I've been told that if you really want to see the night sky, you got to get somewhere where it's really dark. And by really dark, I mean you got to get away from cities with all the light pollution. You heard of that term? I'm not saying the light's bad. I'm just saying where there are cities and electricity's running through street lights, that light goes off. If you've ever flown at night, you know what I'm talking about. But if you really want to see the night sky, you got to get away from the city. You got to you got to get above and away from light pollution. You've got to have a clear night. And you might have to get up in a little higher elevation too, but one of the greatest places I've heard where you can see the night sky is Death Valley in California. Ruth and I hopefully one day will make a trip there and see it for ourselves. But here's what I've been told. If you really want to see the stars in death from Death Valley at night, you not only have to have a clear night, but you've got to get out there and you've got to be willing to hang around for about two hours. Two solid hours to let your, light, your eyes adjust from the lights in your car, the lights on your phone, and the flashlight you probably used walking out there. You know, you've got to take uh, at least 120 minutes and if you'll do that, little by little, you'll begin to see more and more stars that were there all the time. But you couldn't see them and I couldn't see them because we hadn't adjusted yet. I wonder if I do that with God. I know I can't stay on my face before Him all the time. But I wonder how many times I've been guilty of the Lord wanting to be there in such a perceivable way. But I've got so many cares of this world and worries and concerns that He's concerned about too that I can't let the light of those things settle so that I could see Him. As we close out with this final song, would you take some time to worship? Maybe where you are in your seat or maybe around these altars. But would you just take the time to worship? As the praise team comes forward, would you agree with me in prayer? Father, thank You for Your presence today. Lord, we know there's nowhere we can go that You're not. But we also know, Father, that there are times when uh, You want to make Yourself known in, in a very different way. Lord, I pray for whoever needs that today, that that would happen in this time of closing. Lord, help us to take these moments and set aside the struggles, the fears, and the concerns, and simply focus on You. In Jesus' name, Amen.